think we'll start it now just because we don't have too many folks, but don't also want to push it too late. Um, but this way, and hopefully I did that correct, and it's also grabbing the chat. Um, but we can just start with some sort of housekeeping items. And so let's see if I'm getting this right. There we go. Um, so yeah, if you feel so inclined, um, you can update you know, which county you're in or your specialty, that sort of thing. Um, generally nice to use the Q&A for actual questions so that um, Dom will help with moderating that and we can um, just keep track of questions a little bit better in the Q&A versus the chat, but the chat is also an option and we'll share some resources there as well. Um, and then, yeah, just, you know, standard Zoom stuff, muting the mic when you're not talking and just being uh, considerate and um, yeah, making sure that uh, folks feel safe in the space. And so I'll just start uh, with a quick introduction with myself. My name is Amber Schott. I'm the Wildfire Resilience Specialist with CAF and uh, Community Alliance with Family Farmers. And uh, we are excited to uh, present this information uh, sort of in a different format than we've done in the past because usually we have our partner, Farmer Campus, who I'll give an intro to as well, um, co-facilitating with us. And so this will be a, a little bit different and a, a fun thing for us to play with and see how it goes um, with a different uh, target group than we've um, worked with. So. Um, with that, I will say I've been in this role for um, a little over a year and a half now and excited to see where we can take the program. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we offer in the program. And then um, without further ado, I'll also have Dom introduce themselves in their role here today as well as with our org. I'm Dom. I use he and they pronouns. I'm a Grizzly Corps fellow who is nearing the end of my service term with CAF in the Wildfire Resilience Program. And I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited to see what we're going to get into in terms of uh, what will, uh, farming through wildfire season looks like when working with folks. And yeah, I'll be in the background just helping out with populating links and stuff like that. Thanks, Dom. And always exhibiting perfect form with the pronouns. I also should have said I use she, her pronouns, but actually don't care if somebody uses other pronouns. Um, so cool, we'll move on if there's no questions about that sort of stuff. But just wanted to start off with this um, quote from Robin Wall Kilmer, because um, there's, it's interesting, like climate change, right? We, we know that there's, it's a destructive sort of force and we've had some serious decades of fire suppression that's increased the prevalence and severity of wildfires. So even though they are scary and intense, um, fire on the landscape is a really important tool. And if it's used intentionally and carefully is a, a regenerative force. And so just sort of sharing how we can start to reframe our relationship to wildfire um, and our, our mindsets about how to approach it. So. Um, with that, I will jump right in. This is just our quick outline of what we're up to for the day. So welcome for the folks who are trickling in, I think, as we as we go. Um, we'll start with also just taking a pulse check of different folks and their experience with wildfire. And then we'll kind of put the whole idea of like wildfire and agriculture in context, because that's kind of a niche area these days. Then we'll kind of just do like a round table and hear from other folks um, with some prompts and then also dive into a live version of um, a section of the workbook that we find the most useful, the comprehensive um, uh, analysis. So um, we'll get right into that. Um, just some background on the Community Alliance with Family Farmers. We're a 45-year-old nonprofit. We just had our, our um, anniversary party last month. And so we've been working in four main program areas, um, ecological farming, policy advocacy, farm to market connections, and farmer services. Farmer services is sort of our catch-all umbrella. And so the Wildfire Resilience Program lives under there along with small farm technology, 
uh, food safety and also organic certification support. So um, we basically are just hoping to identify, develop and deliver different uh, programmatic resources and trainings that are relevant to folks um, in this wildfire agricultural crossover space. And um, a lot of what we do, the program focuses in three areas on preparedness primarily, response and recovery. So in terms of percentages, that's mostly like 75% preparedness and then response is more like 10 and then recovery 15. And mostly recovery is related to um, emergency grants, but it's also related to content that helps people recover from wildfire like running bioremediation classes to help address toxicities in soils and waters and things like that. All right. Oh, there it is. Okay, good. It's shown up. So I wanted to introduce our other partner too, of course, in all of this. Farmer Campus is an amazing woman-owned uh, and run uh, online learning platform. And Natalia is going to introduce uh, the role that Farmer Campus has in the workbook because basically they did the bread and butter. We're kind of just the copy editors. So I want to play this for y'all right now, just so you don't have to read all that text, but it's there if that's how you prefer to get your info. Hearing the audio. Oh no. Okay, I'm pausing it. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, but when I play that, you can't hear it. That's interesting. Okay, let me just double check One our settings. Suggested. Oh, reshare your screen with audio. Okay, let me see real quick. New share. Pardon, advanced sharing options. Oh, great. Well, look at that. Somebody is really on it. Uh, it's Rebecca. I think that was Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not sure that we got what we wanted out of that. Um, I don't see that option, to be honest, but. Usually Let's... there's a little checkbox at the bottom when you're choosing what screen to share. It should also give you the option to share computer audio. At least that's how it looks on my end when I do it's it. When I do it. Ah, excellent. Okay. Love it. I've got a technical person in the house. Hi there. there I'm Natalia, research specialist at UC Davis and co-founder of Farmer Campus, the online learning network for farmers and ranchers. We combine multimedia education, impact storytelling, and collaborative network building. Today, I want to introduce you briefly to our program, Farming Through Wildfire Season. At Farmer Campus, we understand the challenges faced by our farming community when it comes to wildfires. That's why we've synthesized a series of activities and resources into a workbook. We've gone the extra mile by conducting extensive research and interviews since 2017 with farmers and ranchers impacted by wildfires from across the U.S. We've also brought the expertise of reviewers and contributors to ensure that we provide you with the most relevant information. This workbook is a condensed version of our online course, which covers everything from preparedness to response and recovery. We use real life case studies, rich multimedia content and practical activities to help land managers through the critical dimensions of wildfire preparedness. Farmer Campus serves as a virtual space where our agricultural community can come together in a learning network. We've developed these materials not just for farmers and ranchers, but also for their advisors and technical service providers like yourselves so that you can better serve your communities during the wildfire season. We're constantly working to improve our materials. Right now, we're integrating the latest research and updating our livestock sections. At Farmer Campus, we understand the importance of collaboration and teamwork in addressing this issue, so we really welcome you to join us. By working together, we can create a stronger, more resilient agricultural community. Thank you for joining us today and thank you to CAF for your partnership. We hope you find these materials helpful and we hope to hear from you. Bye. Awesome. Okay, so we'll try to, uh, the quick and dirty of that, and actually Dom, if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and drop Natalia's contact info in the chat in case anyone wants to reach out directly. Natalia and Katie are the powerhouses behind Farmer Campus. 
And this just sort of recaps um, what they've got on there. They do have a farming through wildfire um, uh, course. And so what the workbook does is basically distill that all down into one resource. And it's been several years in the making with lots of different input from farmers and specialists and researchers. Um, and our last update to this was in January, but there's still a few little things that we're tweaking. And so hopefully another update will be coming probably at the end of the year and hopefully some more printed um, in, in person tangible copies for those who like to get their resources that way. Um, and if, um, yeah, sorry, I can't see y'all. So hopefully that made sense and um, we can just cruise on through. Um, I'll do this now too. Uh, hopefully Dom can launch the poll, but we're really curious to just get a pulse of the folks that are on the call, what your experience is with wildfire, whether that's both personal and or professional context, it's okay. Um, the poll is really just like technically multiple choice, but choose the top one that's impacted you the most because we like to just kind of see if there's any trends across the space in terms of um, what folks have been uh, doing. And so go ahead, I think, oh, you know what? I probably didn't make Dom a co-host, so that's my fault. Uh, Y'all should see that now and be able to weigh in on it. Um, I think it's only when we're in webinar format that we need all that, so. Um, and I know we're all kind of dispersed throughout California, so um, some areas definitely have more high chronic risk and impacts than others. Um, I use a, a app called Watch Duty, and I've been keeping track of where the clusters are, and it looks like Southern California is getting hit harder this year earlier. So um, curious, yeah, what what the results will be here. Um, so I think we've got almost everybody participating now. Great. Thank you. So um, yeah, obviously a little bit of a split, but most people know someone who's been impacted. Um, looks like one person has had some direct impacts um, and the, or in, it, indirect impacts, which a lot of people don't realize they've had ind indirect. They don't think necessarily like, oh, like, you know, smoke from a fire that's actually hundreds of miles away, that's still an impact. So, you know, if it affects you in, in any kind of way, that's, that's still an effect um, and something to consider, especially for agricultural producers, right? Because even though they can't say, hey, I lost crops to like, you know, fire directly, they can say, well, reduce productivity, right? Or prolonged heat exposure. Those are all things that can affect their operations. And so, yeah, it's good to see that some folks have already tried, you know, uh, and hopefully successfully provided some services to address wildfires in their region. So thanks, y'all, for participating in that. Okay. Um, oh, apologies. I wasn't sharing the results, but there you go. You can see it yourselves. Okay. Let's cruise on. Um, and hopefully again, feel free to uh, ping me as we go here if there's questions. We don't have to wait to the end. We can do what we like. It's a nice small group. So, um, all right, back to this. There we go. So I just wanted to frame up um, some of this, uh, the piece about um, farmers as land stewards, because they're already doing a lot of the work that is relevant to understanding wildfire. And examples of that are, you know, the sort of like grazing that they may be doing on their property. A lot of folks do their own um, fire buffers with livestock. Um, and they also are always watching the, you know, soil, water quality, um, biodiversity, different different aspects, you know, of their farming or, or ranching or orchard operations that feed into the conditions that affect wildfire. Um, and so that's a really important thing to think about because we'd like to lean into that expertise and that like monitoring, you know, on-site knowledge and capability already um, to just like think about how they understand their little niche uh, ecosystems and uh, also their communities, right? Like that's another really important aspect of this is that they're social leaders, right? They know the people, they know the, the actual natural resources really well, but they also know the, the human resources really well too. And so they have those um, connections typically with their, their uh, you know, other 
local folks who are either in the ag um, space or provide other services. And that's kind of one thing where we say like we target small farmers, small and mid-sized farmers with our content, but a lot of it is still relevant to ag communities and folks in rural areas because nobody farms in a void, right? They're all part of some sort of network. Um, and so that network, this is a cool little diagram that Farmer Campus put together that I just love because it really demonstrates like how many different touch points there are for people across this little intersection. And so, you know, we might not be thinking about mutual aid or food banks as something that's important for wildfires, but during evacuation, right, what, what is it? It's like community centers that are showing up, right, and that sort of thing. So food hubs and distributors like leaning in um, to help support things. And of course, you know, service providers, right? There's all these different services. And sometimes folks don't know that they're eligible for those services, especially when they're under stress, right? So letting them know that these things exist in advance is also just as critical as like providing actual direct support during disaster response and recovery. And I think a lot of us saw this, you know, recently over the winter, right? Probably with the storm's impact. And so it, it's basically, uh, it's, it's very similar, like, replicable model for wildfire as well. All right, so this is just an opportunity for everybody to, you know, if they feel comfortable coming off camera or unmiking, um, or if you feel like you, you know, just wanna put it in the chat, that's okay too. But um, it's a nice tight group. So it might be kind of fun just to say, you know, who you are, what do you do, you know, your specialty or your region and kind of like, what's what is sums up for you right now? I know somebody asked me recently, like, okay, what's the deal with wildfire? Like, should be, we be really concerned or it's like, it's a slow start to the season. Is that a good sign? So just in that context of like, what are you anticipating or feeling about wildfire and like your service work that you do? And I might have to volunteer some folks or popcorn you around. I'll go. This is Darcy. Can, can you Hi, hear Darcy. Me? Yeah, Hi. go ahead. So I'm, I'm Darcy Cook. I'm the uh, district manager at Mission Resource Conservation District in Fallbrook. That's North County, Northeast San Diego County. And we have a really high concentration of small farmers there. And I'm actually really proud to say that I collaborated on a, a recent Cal Fire grant with Off Farmer Campus. Uh, it hasn't been awarded yet, I'm still hopeful. <laughs> and that was specifically looking at working with producers in my area um, on you know, wildfire planning. And most of the producers where I live are pretty cognizant of wildfire, uh, but there's lots of little things that you know, most people haven't thought about. So hoping to get that program. Uh, I think we're always concerned about wildfire here. Uh, we haven't had a really big one for few years, but, you know, it's just part of what goes on here, unfortunately. That's it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I think uh, you had that relationship with Natalia already, so she roped you into attending. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing. And I'll, I'll yeah, go Spencer. Can, yeah, I can go. <laughs> Um, so I'm a project manager for the Upper Salinas Las Tablas Resource Conservation District, and uh, there's a lot of crossover with uh, small farms and uh, the risk of wildfire in this region. And so I'm kind of here just to see how um, this service can can help assist with that. I have a grant currently where I'm producing a number of forest management plans in the region. Um, and I was just at a fire safe council yesterday and kind of everybody's a little bit on edge right now. It's getting really, really hot and there's just a ton of fuel accumulation. And no matter how many times people have mowed, we're starting to see regrowth even now. So the two, uh, you know, factors of, of wildfire and ag uh, are really relevant to our RCD. So yeah, we're just, um, trying to do everything we can to get ahead of it. And so it seems like this resource is a great thing to tap into for that. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing. I know each region kind of has its um, particular challenges and out here, I'm in Paso and Spencer's just south of me. Uh, you know, it's a lot of open grassland, oak woodland, savanna, et cetera. So I know some of your forest management plans right, are more on the coastal side of the county, but um we just yeah exactly everyone's like 
I can only mow so many times before, you know, like, or, um, and that's actually where I really, I'll, I'll try to not be on my soapbox too long about this, but fire as a tool, because you're not really going to get as much regrowth if you're using fire as a tool instead of these more mechanical methods, right? So those rains are like very beneficial for our aquifer and so challenging for this exact reason that you mentioned with all the flashy fuels, fine fuels on the ground. So, um, Annika, I don't want to call you out, but I want to welcome you in if you want to share. Thank you. No problem. I'm very happy to talk. Uh, my name is Annika Forrester. I currently work with the Center for Land-Based Learning, and um, your marketing got my eye, so uh, I decided to sign up. Um, I, I could have checked all five of those boxes. <laughs> um, the house I grew up in in the hills of Oakland burned in 1991, along with 3,000 other homes in a matter of 24 hours, which was kind of the, you know, the monumental kickoff to uh, climate change driven urban wildfire uh, phenomenon now that are routine. <laughs> I lived in Ventura County for the last 18 years. I worked for the California Strawberry Commission. I did a lot of consulting training and development um, for farm supervisors. In fact, during the Thomas fire, I was running a supervisor training program and we had to evacuate my home with my elderly parents and my kids and two dogs and drive to Bakersfield out of the Matilla Canyon. <laughs> and so I've, I've lived wildfires up close and personal, but specifically in the agricultural context, because the guys that were the people that were in my program at that time, we, we missed a week of class as a, as a function of the Thomas fire, which was late 2017. But um, I had people from all over the county um, and we had guys in the hills of Santa Paula that were up all night defending their orchards and using their orchard pumps and their own irrigation systems to combat the flames um, against their employers admonitions to get the hell out. They saved the orchard, <laughs> the workers. <laughs> so, so I've seen it from a whole bunch of sides. And then of course, uh, just another uh, watershed moment in wildfire smoke and ag worker you know, um, intersection. There was a later fire in Ventura County up in the Conejo grade a couple of years after that, that was spectacularly visual because if you know that area up out of the Oxnard Plain, you've got these hills to the south that head up to LA, Santa Monica Mountains, and the fire was up there and there was just a huge column of smoke that was just spectacular visuals for photography and lettuce harvesters on the ground working under this looming black cloud looked like it was the dust bowl the point being that um that picture ricocheted around the world and farm worker advocates lost their shit screaming bloody murder about the abuses of farm workers but in fact i was working with the supervisors who were on the ground at the time and the air was perfectly clean at ground level and those workers wanted to get that produce out before they knew they had to leave. So there's always a story, you know, a photograph doesn't tell the whole story. Um, so, so there's a whole bunch of reasons we got to get our heads wrapped around how to have protocols and procedures around wildfire and smoke in particular um, for farm workers, for, for, first and foremost. <laughs> That's really relevant. We've got a gal from the Air Quality District on our advisory council board that you know basically helps us address that component of it. Um, and probably, as you know, SB 1044 also addresses farm worker rights uh, under like evacuation disaster conditions. And so, those are the kinds of things that we try to help people understand are in the works um, and and like what how that affects their operations. You know, both in terms of benefits but also in terms of considerations especially for things like laborers so yeah you sound like you have a wealth of knowledge we might have to hit you up as <laughs> well, a copy and, editor for our next version and, and i'm here specifically because i manage our apprenticeship program and i do the curriculum element of that and making sure the people that we're putting out on farms as farm managers who are typically working for some of the smaller operators and unfortunately the smaller operators unfortunately are not up to speed on regulations and how to comply with them for some reason. Um, and this is going to be a new one that's going to sting them, just like, you know, all the other things. <laughs> Let's talk more. I think there's, yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of collaborative potential there to help folks because that's exactly big piece of it is there's a lot of regulatory tape for people and small operators have less bandwidth to do that on their own, um, yeah. whether they have, you know, the education or capability or not, a lot of them just don't have the time to navigate that stuff. So um, it's really important, these TSP roles that we all hold. So thank you for um, adding that. And 
Um, certainly not last, but or, or not least, but Rebecca, if you want to join in and tell us about what you, you do, that would be awesome. Yeah, happy to. Hi, everybody. I'm Rebecca Ozeran. I am a livestock and natural resources advisor with the University of California Cooperative Extension. I'm in Fresno and Madera counties. Um, and so our biggest fire recently was the Creek Fire in 2020. Um, and a lot of ranchers lost a lot of cattle in that fire. Um, it burned quite a bit of forest service land where we have grazing allotments. Um, so we're sort of still trying to figure out, you know, the best strategies to help folks out and avoid that kind of thing happening in the future. Uh, one thing that has been, I think, a success, at least so far, we haven't had to use it was that there's an Ag Pass program that was developed by some of my colleagues in the northern part of the state and on the coast, um, Matthew Shapiro down in Ventura County, for instance. Um, so we replicated a similar um, access program in Madera County. And so we have about 30 um, producers, ranchers that have got their credentials in with basically local law enforcement so that in the event of another fire, they can, when conditions are safe enough, they can go beyond road closures to care for or evacuate their livestock. Um, so that's one potentially really big success. Again, we haven't had to use it since it's been in place, um, but it was put in place because of the, the Creek Fire and the many other enormous fires that we've seen. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we have a new tool um, to reduce direct losses. And I think the longer term question will be like, what are those indirect losses and how can we really reduce negative impacts to folks? I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, Dom and I actually worked very closely um, with Tracy. Tracy, I'm going to butcher her last name. She's in Butte County, obviously, uh, you, you know, Tracy, but um, livestock advisor up there to, to basically help us develop a post that um, Dom is going to pop in the chat if he hasn't already. Um, and it basically is exactly that kind of helping folks understand and navigate what those ag pass programs do and do not do for folks. And obviously, they're very tailored to the region you're in. Um, but that's a, a pretty important tool for folks to know about. So if you need a quick and dirty link to give to folks, you can do that, or you can uh, hit me up and I'll send you our physical flyers if you prefer that that way. So thanks. That really helps us. I mean, there's certainly a theme here, which is, um, you know, listening to the community's needs and responding accordingly. And so I know it can be challenging. I think a lot of uh, TSP, you know, orgs and programs are uh, understaffed, <laughs> you know, and also possibly very unsung heroes and heroines um, across the space. And so I just like really um, want to show my gratitude for y'all and the work that you're doing. Um, and hopefully you can help us make um, whatever we're producing better and more applicable for your clients. So awesome. Okay, we will keep cruising. Um, I wanted to now introduce the um, actual workbook. If you haven't um, already downloaded it per the registration prompts, I think Dom will be able to put the link there in the in the chat. And you may have noticed it does ask you for your, your name and email. And part of that is because uh, Farmer Campus wants to track the type of people that are accessing the material. Um, if you didn't have a chance uh, to get to that, it only takes a second and then it comes as, you know, a, a PDF that you can either download or just view online. So um, take a second to do that and then we can um, kind of jump in. I'll do a bit of an overview before we do the live demo portion that I mentioned previously. Um, so really just want to um, use this slide to articulate that, you know, we've kind of summed up some of the components that contribute to wildfire risk. And this obviously depends on where you're located, you know, throughout the state, what type of a region and, and considerations you have. Um, and so those are uh, things that we built and like kind of pulled out of different case studies that Farmer Campus initiated, as well as like working with, you know, livestock extension advisors and specialists in, in these areas. Um, but basically just trying to figure out what types of risks exist so that folks can understand like how to uh, reduce and adapt to those. Um, and so there are some things that are, are within our you know, ability to change and some things that are not, right? So 
um, like slope and landscape type, you know, you just might be located in an area where like you cannot change your slope, right? You're on, you know, 15 or whatever percent grade. And that's just going to be a factor that you have to manage for. Um, and so the things that we like tell the people to, to, you know, focus on is more like these vulnerability and response capacity categories, because that's where they have more agency. Um, and so, but the threats are still important, right? And so identifying what, you know, what are your weak points or what are the pieces that might be the, the most important factors at play? We all probably have seen this and know this that unfortunately you could have critically amazing defensible space, but if you have a wind driven fire, like even uh, some of the, you know, most uh, exemplary um, landscape management um, cannot, you know, protect something. And so we have to kind of take some of this with a grain of salt. And that's also why it's important that folks have response capacities identified in advance, because just if you lump everything into preparation, right, that's not necessarily going to help you um, if that type of uh, scenario occurs. So thinking about other things like the preparedness factors, um, you know, fire risk that goes into infrastructure and, you know, what types of materials your buildings are made of, things like that but also these mutual aid networks. So one thing that we noticed is like during evacuation, it was like, hey, farmers have all this food that they need to like put somewhere. And yet like a lot of the federal FEMA stuff was requiring, you know, community centers to purchase food from out of state. So we actually work also on a policy side um, to advocate for changes within these types of programs or grant, you know, things to make it so that they can kind of have like vendor preferences and things like that, that support small farmers in, in that kind of um, situation. But also no one uh, wants to talk about financial or like insurance stuff, but it is critical. Um, and a lot of, you know, small operators are already on shoestring budgets and stuff, but, you know, as much as possible within whatever their um, personal circumstances are having some sort of safety net, because we know there will be lost crops, there will be lost labor, you know, there will be infrastructure impacts, like all that stuff is going to cost. And even if it's covered by insurance, right, it's going to take time to get those things um, covered. So definitely having some sort of little um, buffer financially really is important. And then the workforce preparedness piece is also like, are your, you know, field workers, are your staff, your laborers, your managers, et cetera, like ready to respond to emergencies, right? Like, do they feel confident? Do they know where all the important infrastructure is or where to gather, you know, et cetera. So um, just understanding that piece too. And there's some people that are really leaning into this. Like there's a, a group in the North Bay that does tailgates and like helps provide PPE to like vineyard workers and, and managers so that they all just have like a quick little chat while they're already eating lunch, you know, and basically just get people talking and thinking about these topics so that they can have a little bit more comfort when something happens. Um, and then again, as you all know, right, social networks, that's the family and friends, of course, but also agencies, right? Like, again, a lot of these great services and programs, but some of it's not available in appropriate languages and, and that sort of thing. So we're all, I know, thinking about the justice and equity components of delivery of these programs and services. So anything that we're all sharing and working on together, hopefully, you know, we can um, continue to collaborate and what, an example of that is at CAF, we have an internal uh, Latinx team that really helps us with the language that we use in our materials. So we basically have something called like a style guide, where if you have very technical stuff you're trying to, you know, express to folks um, and you have to take in consideration some of the reading levels and things like that, that we use language that's accessible. So just noting that. All right. And real losses, we kind of touched on this real briefly, like that some people don't realize that they've experienced impacts because they're like, well, a fire didn't come through directly, right? So they just think like, oh, I'm not eligible for whatever because, you know, the fire was still 20 miles away, whatever it is. But, you know, if they had to leave because of smoke, you know, impacts, if their laborers had to leave, you know, or um, storage crops, like things like that, that can be affected. Um, and this like impaired perennial production, that's huge, right? Like if you've got crops you can't pull out of the field because you're an orchardist or something, right? Um, that That's a real challenge. And I think you, uh, there was maybe Annika that mentioned that too about like, you know, the some of the vineyards, like they, depending on the varietal, right? Like some, some of it has to stay on the vine longer or whatever the issue is. And so they risk, you know, smoke taint, et cetera, et cetera, and can lose like three years of, of revenue from uh, having to, 
basically scrap an entire harvest. So there's a lot of things that are obvious like damaged infrastructure and melted fencing and things like that, but also these habitat impacts, right? Like you get a pretty intense wildfire and now you've got less vegetative cover, less water holding capacity in the soil, less, you know, um, forbs and herbs for your pollinators. Like suddenly, you know, the birds aren't coming back. Like, so you've got insect pest problems. Like there's all these, um, you know, compounding factors that are really important to consider. So, um, and these all came from, uh, you know, case studies with actual farmers. So. Um, I'm sure there's others maybe we don't have listed, so feel free to um, give us that feedback and we can hopefully update that. And then some folks are just more, you know, hands on, as we all know, farmers like to, they're DIY, they like to do a lot of physical things. Um, and so there's more like these activity type things too within the workbook that help folks like, you know, go out with a piece of paper and do a rapid risk assessment of their, you know, infrastructure or that sort of thing. Um, or like give them, you know, like the, the you know, uh, tools that they need to go do like a farm map and that sort of thing that can just help them feel a little bit more prepared, but also their, their workers, like just kind of training everybody, okay, here's a scenario and do a dry run, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or, you know, just where to go during the, you know, events um, that may occur, whether it's fire or, or other types of disasters. Um, and my favorite low hanging fruit is emergency, you know, communication plan. Um, uh, I've worked on some farms and there's no cell service even on like regular days sometimes. So you have to have like your, you know, your radios or your other alternate points where you know you get service to be able to like meet people there if something happens. Um, and so I feel like that's one of those ones that like everybody can do, but often they don't because we all know farmers are literally and figuratively like running from little fire to little fire, putting out, um, you know, problems and triaging issues uh, throughout the season. So um, and, and it used to be right that folks had <laughs> kind of some downtime in the winter to like do this prep work, whether it was like the insurance and the finances and building community and things like that. But it's like more and more the case that like our fire season is all year round. And so like, you know, the, or they're dealing with other impacts and, and stressors like storms or drought. So it just seems like there's never a good time for this stuff. But if we just keep trying to support folks and give them tools that make it a little bit easier. Um, so there is like a plan for recovery if something happens. I think the most valuable thing I ever heard is like, don't think that the person that you have on your insurance is who you're actually going to work with when something happens, because that's usually not the case. Like your rep is not always the person who's going to like, you know, go to bat for you. It's It may be like someone at a much larger headquarters or whatever. So, and that's if you're lucky enough to get insurance these days, right? So we also work um, at that policy level, trying to help improve the access of insurance for farmers and also just rural folks in general. So, um, and then also of course, these pieces about, you know, our farming methods, the social fabric, and it got a little bit cut off there on the slide, sorry, but um, we've got a whole bunch of stuff. It's uh, it's uh, never ending. So there is a, a risk and vulnerability assessment within the um, the workbook that is not nearly as comprehensive as what we're gonna go through in the live demo portion of today's um, presentation. But I just wanted to mention it because a lot of folks are like, oh yeah, I don't have time for that comprehensive stuff, right? But what could I do? What's the quick and dirty version? Um, and so that's why I like this slide is because there's a few things that folks can do just to self-evaluate self within these four themes, right? It's just like the background risk factors can be a lot of things. It can be like we said, your you know geographical location, like slope and things like that. So that you kind of understand, oh, I'm at the top of a slope, fire moves faster going uphill. Like I need to think about that. Or it could be things like, oh, I know people have a medical condition on site. Like, what am I going to do to make sure like they have more time, right? Or like that their medication is like ready to go or whatever it might be. So those background risk factors are also important. Defensible space. We actually did a whole separate webinar on this with Luca Carmignani from the UC um, Cooperative Extension. He's the fire advisor down there in Riverside. And it was, uh, you know, and also one of our advisory council members who's both a CAL FIRE captain and a farmer, because we were like, there's this unique uh, type of defensible space, you know, that happens on farms that isn't the same applicability to like single family residential stuff. So we actually did a whole separate like training on this because 
it seemed like a nuanced enough, um, you know, uh, considerations for farmers. So when we say a defensible space, yes, that can mean kind of your standard like zone, you know, three zone approach that CAL FIRE has put out. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are other pieces too that operators have to think about because often they're living where their livelihood is, right? It's not just like they just peace out and they keep working or something, right? It's, it's very challenging. So defensible spaces, it's whole own bucket, but that's another critical one. Um, and then, um, so the hardening is more related to that. That's uh, just, it's also um, this piece about, you know, access because, uh, you might not be able to afford to put, you know, a brand new roof on your barn, and that is a, a thing that can help it from igniting, but you probably can, um, you know, uh, work on things like, uh, we, we say that this is kind of uh, a low-hanging fruit, I guess, but a lot of people don't realize that most structures ignite from ember intrusion, and so one of the first things they could do is just stick like some aluminum foil over their venting systems. And so that's a cheap and dirty trick, like to just get in there if you know fire's coming, like, and you know, you may not be on site to like be able to manage any impacts. Like that is like one of those pieces about building hardening that hardly costs you anything. And just knowing that alone could save your structure. So emergency access, this is a trickier one sometimes because folks, you know, they know that it takes time and money and labor, right, to do a lot of the vegetative maintenance. But one of the biggest things we've heard is like, um, if you can't uh, get like a, a, a fire truck like into your site, like they're not gonna help you, right? So, uh, <laughs> and this could be something as, as uh, simple as like, you're on the other side of a bridge and that bridge isn't weighted for those types of trucks, right? So just knowing that those factors are at play, um, will help you understand like what type of response or support you're going to be able to get in, in a particular space. So, all right. Um, and like I said, I talk a lot and really fast. So feel free to pop in here and ask questions as we go, because we've got this like light group so we can facilitate some fun discussion in between. All right. Um, so again, just I want to just say that Again, like if people are like, I'm nowhere near doing any of that other stuff, right? Like, what can you do? Well, a communication and an evacuation and a shelter in place plan are like pretty easy to do. So the communication plan is just something as simple as like, okay, like your kids are at school, right? Like, what's the number that you call when you suddenly have to evacuate and like go get them? Um, and just just having that kind of stuff like around or is like, who's your neighbor that you can be like, hey, we've got to go, um, you know, and we're just letting you know, and our gates are open so that the animals can move, you know, or sharing gate codes. That's a thing that folks are doing now in these spaces where there are larger like livestock um, uh, grazing operations and stuff. It's just like sharing gate codes so that they can both move animals, but also move people across landscape in an emergency. Um, and that evacuation piece too is really interesting because what we've seen, and maybe Rebecca, you want to jump in here. I'm not sure what your experience is, but with a lot of, a lot of large livestock, people just let them they stay, right? Because especially the hooved ungulates, they have usually the ability to uh, move away from fire and then get back in the black and they'll be okay. That doesn't mean they won't have smoke impacts and things like that, but often people just don't have the capacity or the equipment to move their whole herd, right? Like, um, and so that's really, again, where these livestock ag passes are critical so that folks can get back in during an you know, evacuation if it's safe enough to go and like, you know, water and feed their animals, et cetera. So, um, we've seen that um, quite a few times, and um, generally that's what folks do unless, you know, they're like uh, nursing mothers or something like that, depending on the time of year that these impacts happen. So, um, and then shelter in place. So this is the term that I tread lightly with because in California, it's actually a misdemeanor to ignore an evacuation order. So... I'm just flagging that that's not legal, but we know that people get trapped, right? Like, and that it's not a choice. And so that's its own thing. And so just having some options and understand what would you do if you had a shelter in place, you know, where would you go? What's the safest area? Like where are your backup supplies, things like that. Um, and just also flagging that Oregon State's actually working with OSHA to address that issue because a lot of folks that run their own operations want to stay and defend their homes and their operations. 
And so um, there's uh, some interesting, you know, work going on at Oregon State to see if they can develop like training programs, basically, that allow people to do exactly that, where they like, cool, I trained me and my manager and we're staying, you know, and it becomes a legal option for them. So, um, but those are sort of the top three if uh, they just don't have bandwidth for much else. So any questions? I'll take a sip of water since I'm talking a million miles an hour. Okay, forever hold your peace. Okay, so um, again, yeah, workbook, if you haven't downloaded it, go ahead and do that. Um, <clears throat> and we'll basically start on page 15, but I wanted to say that this comprehensive vulnerability assessment, it is dense. It is like, we've heard from farmers that it's the most useful, but it's also very overwhelming. Um, but they also asked us not to make it any shorter. <laughs> so um, we're kind of just doing this bird's eye view at a high level of their operation to start off with when we use this, because it can be a little bit daunting. Um, and then after that, you know, like today, we'll get into the nitty gritty during our live demo and just sort of what we've learned from the community about like the highest risk areas um, you know, and just things that we hadn't really been thinking about in the past about like pest outbreaks. It's not like really something top of mind when you think about wildfire, but there can be all this stressors, you know, to the plants and suddenly the insects like <laughs> sense that and they're, they're on it. And so, um, those are just some of the things that we've been learning as we do this work. And basically it's just a, a laundry list, you know, of, of nuanced risk areas that, uh, farmers have been requesting support in. So that is why. It's looking like that. Um, and you probably can't see that in too great a detail, but there's like basically the little check boxes and then like a priority ranking about like how much time it takes to do each of these little activities under each of these categories. So um, I'll show you that in more detail, but just sort of driving um, home. Uh, and if Dom, if you haven't already popped it in there, um, I, I will brag that we have our own YouTube channel. It's very exciting, Calf Flicks. Um, and so we have different playlists under that. So Wildfire has its own little playlist. Um, and so again, this defensible space piece for ag operators is like a very specific um, and nuanced content. And so that um, is accessible for folks if they want it. Um, but yeah, this also has to do with, you know, the forest management, if you're in a forested area, um, as well as like building hardening infrastructure, et cetera. So, um, but it, it, it also addresses things like equipment. Like what do you do with your, you know, equipment during, during these types of events? So, um, and emergency response is, is again, kind of par partially about those plans, but it's also about like backups to your backups. So when, you know, wildfires happen, often the power is shut off, right? So like, do you have your own backup sources of power or water? You know, what are, what's your access? Um, you know, and then evacuation and response for both people and animals, but also your crops, like, right, like identifying in advance, like, who can my backup markets be, you know, if I get pinched somehow at a certain time of the year, right, like whatever the most vulnerable parts of the year are, it's nice to have that identified in advance, so. And then also, yeah, these recovery relationships, we talked a little bit about having that financial like, you know, nest um, for those kinds of things. So it's it's cash flow, right? Because like, hey, you might, you know, qualify for an NRCS cost share program, but it's probably going to be a couple of years till you see it and you still have to like pay some upfront, right? So that cash flow, um, even if it's just something as simple as like paying for your hotel during evacuation, stuff like that, there's, there's going to be upfront costs. So um, knowing that in advance helps um, and addressing it, even though it's everyone's least favorite topic, it's still critical. Okay, so, woo, take a little breather. Um, but the live demo, um, basically I can share my screen and uh, you know I can show you what I'm doing so that gets recorded for the session, but um, you can just follow along on your PDF if you've got it open. Um, and something that you'll notice right away is that there's like these tables, right? And the, that basically when this is in a print version, it's like a, a seven and a half by 11 like folded. Um, and so it's you know printed on both sides and it's a little booklet. And basically depending on the size of your, your ranch pants, you can fit it you know in your back pocket and drag it around the ranch with you. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind the print version. But um, the idea is that these check boxes, you know, activate 
or activities um, that you know are easiest, hopefully, for you to address. So you kind of look at the time frame that's associated with each activity, and then there's like a little checkbox so that people can be like, as they go through it and complete it, they can be like, boom, I did that one. I'm stoked. Like, and then you know, write their little notes on it or whatever they want to do. So um, it can take years, right, to complete all the activities that are in this workbook. So that's not the expectation, of course, if you're introducing this to any of your you know, clients, but the idea is just sort of like true resilience takes time and you know, just balancing those high priority action items like while chipping away at like longer term or more financially you know, challenging tasks um, is the idea. And so um, without further ado, I think what we'll do is just um, kind of peruse the workbook together and I kind of wanted to get your feedback a little bit on um, what you think from your personal experience with your clients that you're working with, whether it's, you know, those forest management plans or, you know, livestock um, uh, applications um, on the land, what you're thinking, you know, from, from your perspective is the kind of, you know, high priority or easiest kind of low hanging fruit pieces to address. So I'm going to get out of my... Um, sharing for just a second here. Everybody doing okay? Little water break. Okay. <laughs> Y'all came prepared. I like it. Um, okay. I'm going to open mine as well. Um, sorry, I didn't get a like verbal. Does anyone follow themselves? I'm still going to screen share, like I said, but um, you can just guide me verbally if you'd like, um, but you can start on page 15. That's usually um, where the very first one is. So let me get to that. There we go. Okay. Oh, and of course I'm not on the right page. There we go. Okay. So page 15, comprehensive vulnerability assessment. Um, so we did talk briefly about sort of the, this bird's eye view piece. So I'm gonna skip that um, and just get straight into it. Uh, we talked about defensible space and emergency response. So again, those are those, um, if you can do nothing else, right? Those are the ones. But this is kind of where I wanna start is because I think a lot of this starts with people. Um, like how do people feel comfortable? You know, this can be very challenging. Maybe we assume that operators like know their area they, that they're operating in. But some people like live outside the county that they lease land in or something, right? So they may not have those connections or communications like with the you know regional folks who uh, have resources and things like that. So I just kind of wanted to get a pulse check here and see what your thoughts were about this. Like, is the communications plan and the you know uh, contact kind of info piece does I always think of this as like low hanging fruit right like this is obvious just do it it's not that hard but I'm just curious like if you've heard from any of your clients or people that like no that's like I'm an introvert and like I don't know my neighbors or if like they're super well connected like kind of where folks may fall on that spectrum. This is Rebecca. I guess one question I actually have is if you've had any experience with brand new farmers and ranchers, like how do they start to build those connections? Um, and how are there strategies that could be included in this on how to get connected to your neighbors if you're new? That's a great that's a question. Really, that's a really good question. And one thing as an RCD manager, um, a lot of people don't know about resource conservation districts. And we get people you know, out of the blue saying, I'm starting a farm, and they think we're going to give them all this information. But it's a really great place to start, because we at least direct them to where they can find things. Thanks, Darcy. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Because uh, I'll just say that, Rebecca, the first thing I thought of is it depends because there's a lot of cultural differences, too, about how people like to communicate and connect. So, you know, especially if maybe you don't speak the language or, you know, that sort of thing, it may be very difficult to build those relationships and understand what resources are in the region. Spencer, did you have something you wanted to add? I was just going to say, in our region, more often than not, our neighbors know each other really, really well. Um, whether they uh, are friends or not is a different story, but, um, you know, people usually know exactly who their neighbors are in their past, 
Um, and, it, and on a topic this important, I'm sure they would be happy to communicate about it, but um, sometimes the friendly neighbor thing isn't, isn't a thing around here too. So something to be aware of. That's a good point. Kind of like that classic, like, that's my fence line. No, it's my fence line. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And lots um, of water issues around here, you know, so tensions right. get high quick, kind of. Absolutely. And I think this actually goes back to like, you're only as safe as your neighbors are too, right? Like you can be your own little bubble of like perfect defensible space. But if you share property lines with folks who are not able to manage uh, or refuse to manage their landscapes, you know, um, you, that's its own little risk factor and impact. So even when we're doing this, these, you know, quick risk or uh, assessments or the comprehensive one, those are things that we want to discuss with clients, especially if they know there's a challenging relationship to manage with their neighbors or something like that. And I would just offer that, um, I think <laughs> as cliche as it may sound, there's these like, you know, neighborhood like online groups, right? Like Nextdoor or even Facebook or things like that, that like people do actually plug into and listen to quite a bit. I mean, I actually communicate with a lot of my farmers through Instagram because they tend to use that platform more than like answering a phone call. So it is interesting. I think the answer is A, it depends, and then B, like kind of, you know, meet people where they're at basically um, and have a variety of communication plug-in points for depending, you know, where, what sort of level of, uh, you know, um, I guess, finessed information they're ready for. But um, something that I'll just say is that we try to do this for a few different things. Um, so Dom, if you can, um, I'll just shamelessly plug this now that we wrote a couple of posts about uh, things like the, the public power sa safety shutoffs and like evacuations and stuff like that, just so people can kind of understand what are the steps of these pieces, like when it comes to having a communication plan, right? Like, how is this thing going to affect me? So um, those can be really useful to share out with folks in your region um, just to get them started. Because that's what a lot of folks I think like to do is like a little bit of like personal research, right? So they kind of have an understanding of the topics and knowledge and maybe some tools and then start having discussions with other folks. But that's just my experience. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay. Um, so yeah, this is sort of just like a uh, private tour of the comprehensive uh, yeah, uh, vulnerability assessment. Um, but it's nice to hear from y'all about, you know, some of these challenges or, um, yeah, funnels and barriers and things that, you know, we, we, you know, again, here we are with community and neighbors, right? So um, it is interesting that the answer to this could be um, challenging with other folks. Um, it may, it may take a long time to get comfortable sharing your evacuation plans and routes with your neighbors, you know, that sort of thing. But hopefully, um, you know, through uh, us supporting like long-term land access and things like that, that people will want to build these types of relationships and these resources for themselves and their, um, their neighbors. So, um, but this one in particular comes to mind. I'm not sure how long it's, uh, I wanted to highlight it because it is a long-term one, but creating a backup plan for labor, right? So we just talked about SB 1044 and how that affects like the ability of farm workers to leave a site if they don't feel safe, right? In, in If there's an evacuation order, et cetera. So um, it's important to just understand that and like help your clients kind of maybe figure out like what, what are they going to do, right? Is that just more equipment to have like ready to go because there is an option for substituting labor and equipment or, you know, is it like hunker down and like, you know, protect this corner of the vineyard or whatever, because like this is the most valuable, like with whatever you've got, right? Like you kind of just identifying based on the ag um, operator type, what the challenges are. Um, so yeah, I just want to kind of flag some of these that even though they're longer term ones, they are also very important. Um, and that's what I was also saying about, oh, this is a, a contentious one too, like having written agreements in place with other growers, right? You were just saying, Spencer, water wars, like what if your neighbor is perfectly fine and their well's not down and the electricity to your site is shut off? Right, like maybe if you have that relationship, you can say, hey man, can I please just like snag water for two days like to get through this, right? That's a really important factor um, when it comes to fire, especially 
but other um, uh, you know, disasters are also relevant there. Um, okay, we'll just keep cruising for a minute here. So what I wanted to show you, um, I, again, you know, the sort of the deeper you get into each list of, of each category, the longer and longer the you know, activities take. And, and so that's kind of intentionally laid out that way so that you see the easiest ones first. Or, or not always the easiest, but sometimes the uh, least amount of time investment, which of course we're rolling into hard wildfire season. So it's gonna be like, what can I do right now, right? So, um, and that's where I would say, everybody should know where they're gonna meet, right? Like if something happens and the farm's on fire, like where do you go? What's the safe place? Like that's such a critical piece and it's so easy to identify that if you know your operation pretty well. So um, hopefully folks, you know, have a, a, a water site, like a, a reservoir or something that like basically has some sort of protective, you know, space where there's not a lot of vegetation or something like that. Um, but also just like letting people know how to access things too, right? Like, so if you've got backups to your backups, great, but does anyone know how to operate them? Like, you know, I, I experienced that at Pi Ranch um, and it was interesting because it was like, oh, well, this like shutoff was installed with like an aftermarket switch. And like, you know, it's very particular, like you need to be careful what you're doing or you're going to injure somebody. So um, yeah, it's a, it's an important piece to understand your infrastructure and also just like, hey, you know, so-and-so is not here today for whatever reason, and they're usually the point person. So who's the backup point person, right? Who's the key substitute personnel? Um, and then again, I think this is the easiest one right here. It's just like, everybody can make a go bag, right? Like this is not expensive. Uh, and you can just stuff your emergency contacts list in there, maybe laminate it, who knows? Um, but basically, you know, just some first aid stuff, a couple of like snacks, some water and, you know, your facilities map, like done, right? And actually people say, you should probably have more than one of these, right? One in every like farm vehicle or like one in your personal vehicle and one in your farm vehicle and one in the house, like, you know, because they're so easy to do and you can buy them, of course, pre-made, but like, you know, if you want to make sure you have your dog's medication in each one or something like yeah, just making sure that that's one of my favorite ones. It's so easy, everybody can do it. Um, this is kind of back to what we're talking about, like personnel knowing the location of tools and equipment, like, you know, fire extinguishers and hoses and all that stuff. Basically in California, unless you are trapped, you should not be doing all that, but you should still know where all that stuff is because fires can actually originate on the farm right? Like your spark arrestor on your mower is not working and you just lit a little baby grass fire. So a lot of people actually have like water tanks that follow their mowers and stuff now because of that sort of thing. So um, not everyone is following the instructions to mow before 10 a.m. And we've got a heat dome going on in California. <laughs> That's my new favorite term, heat dome. Um, so anyway, just kind of flagging that these are uh, some tricky components here, but still important to think about just because of the legalities there. Um, but also people will be like, oh yeah, we've got hoses, we've got all that stuff, but they don't check the condition of that equipment and try to go use it in an emergency and it's like falling apart or malfunctioning or whatever it might be. So it's really important to um, check that, especially with fire extinguishers, you know, it's pretty easy. You just go get them serviced. Um, all right, I'll pause. Any questions or th is this kind of making sense to people? Like we went really deep into all this. Like we've basically tried to think of every little nitty gritty detail that no one really wants to deal with, but is still critical. All right. I'll just say I'm really appreciating all the detail and all the examples because I think these are the things that don't come up until somebody has a problem. And so it's great to now have this all in one spot that people can look to. That's yeah, music I agree. To my ears. It, well, <laughs> it's it's some crazy stuff you would never think about, like bringing a, a water container along with your mower. I, mean, I love that. I guess that's something you learn the hard way. Yep. Yeah, we we heard that from farmers. We didn't come up with that, right? So it's exactly um, 
folks are really adaptive and resilient even within their you know own operations and that's why we wanted to tap you know operators first and, and ask them about their experiences because they know what they're dealing with better than anyone you know and so it's less just helping articulate that into something that's actionable and can be explained and shared with folks across you know a, a wide variety of, of uh, operation types so yeah go ahead um, I had to step away. Unfortunately, I got distracted because I have uh, somebody working in my house right now fixing something for me, thankfully. But I don't know if you would address this. What I'd be curious to hear about is um, the new legislation and um, how that intersects with this, because this looks like great preparatory stuff. But my experience with farm employers um, makes me not very optimistic they're likely to walk themselves through a a, 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 a workbook that is not required by law <laughs> because even a lot of farm employers who have things required by law don't do those things so this is great um how do we compel people to do these types of things and how much of this is needs to be compelled or or is by law because that's the piece i at least want to get to them is the 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 compliance piece as the you know as the floor as the entry level <laughs> yeah classic carrot versus the stick question I, yeah um, unfortunately <laughs> yeah and i i don't know that i have an answer per se what i think we lean on is a peer-to-peer -peer learning model where we host field days to demonstrate some of these activities and we have a farmer that's already familiar with a practice right show it to other farmers like basically so you don't have a talking head or like an academic you know it's someone you can identify with like sharing information talking about real real world applications um and that that's like the safe space i think for people to ask the questions that they wouldn't ask a regulator right about these kind of things but none of this is like a requirement per right. se be, beyond like uh this you know sb 1044 understanding that your labor force has the right without repercussions to you know uh, leave if they don't feel safe during a, a disaster and working in that space. So like you said, the air quality might not be triggering a, a, a regulatory um, you know compliance factor on the ground. but if a employee feels unsafe in a like oncoming fire, uh, they can leave. They can just take care of what they need to take care of, you know, and and I, I think that that's a good measure because we know that labor practices have been abused by even things like the Ag Pass in the past where, you know, it was like somewhat like implemented on the fly and there weren't really some good checks and balances about like how many people are you bringing in and how many people are you bringing out right to a, a, a space that can be quite dangerous. So, um, I think that that's kind of the the intent of those uh, types of programs and and laws is to find that like happy medium balance between like okay here we still want to support you know small operators having access having support but you know with these like contingencies on how you're going to do that like you know uh, with accountability so it's a really great question and I'm glad you raised that. Um, and I, I don't have an answer. Maybe we want to run this by the governor. I don't know. Oh, well, yeah. How to get small growers in compliance is my big head scratcher. Yeah, and, and we do offer a lot of TA around that for things like food safety compliance and organic certification now. But, um, you know, in terms of wildfire, it, it really is like this just giant beast that, you know, our first attempt is to just like parse it out. What are the issues and what are the challenges and that identify activities that basically people were hoping that they would be inspired, right? They see this list and they say, oh, that's one that I hadn't thought about, but I can do it right now. Right. And that by building like a little bit of confidence each time they do an activity, they can work up to some of that other stuff that's a little bit larger and, and more challenging and, you know, just, yeah, mm -hmm. scary. So, yeah. Any other thoughts about this sort of stuff? I, I, this is why I wanted to dig in and use this block of time primarily just to show you some of this like really nuanced um, information that came out of those special sessions and, and interviews and case studies. So, um, but yeah, um, you know, things like, uh, safety measures, right? Like that's 
I mean, we know what the biology like flight or fight response is, right? And most folks are like ready to get the heck out of somewhere if there's imminent danger. So they're not necessarily thinking about like, oh, I need to shut off the gas, you know? But we would hope that people do have that in mind after they read this, right? And that they're like, okay, cool. If I have time, I'm going right by that because I know that that's just gonna contribute to even more damage, right? So they understand the value in taking a few seconds to go do that thing. All right, um, anyone else want to jump in? Keep cruising? Okay, it's a hot Thursday afternoon. We're gonna make it. Um, this may be more to your point too. Here's some training. Um, so, you know, training your key personnel on like the laws, right? If you've got a vineyard manager, they need to know about SB 1044, right? So that they are not trying to like, you know, physically stop staff or something from leaving, um, but also so that they have the, the technical understanding of what they need to be doing, you know, if they're the point person. Um, and I think training staff is like this, like probably everyone here has probably taken a first aid training and then had to refresh it a year later. And that's not frequent enough, right? Like if you were called upon to do your CPR, nine months after your training, you're probably gonna misremember something. And so it's also the frequency. It's like, oh, like that power shut off thing, like the power's out, but we've got a backup Jenny, perfect. But what's the process again, right? Like just quarterly trainings or something like that that really help people get familiar, get comfortable with that type of thing. Cause it's not an if, it's when, right? This is California, fires are not going anywhere. So, um, I just wanted to kind of flag that piece uh, in training folks is, is sort of what we consider like a, a, a good entry um, is just like, you know, the technical pieces, but then also on evacuation and response, um, how to support other people that also might have, you know, other needs, whether that's uh, physical disabilities or, or whatnot, you know, just understanding how to support everybody uh, under those types of scenarios. So, all right. There's a lot more under there, but facilities is probably uh, where most like, <laughs> I would say farmers like to spend their time is because they already like care a lot and put a lot of money into their facilities. And so, um, you know, again, maybe to your point, like how do, you, how do you get them excited or doing something? I would say that this is, um, the time investment is short. So this is another benefit, but like identifying an area for your animals, your vehicles, you know, that sort of thing. Um, if you've got irrigated pasture, great. That's a great place to like park your, you know, <laughs> multi thousand dollar tractor um, because it's not likely to burn. So, um, you know, but even just having like uh, other areas for all your, you know, we all call it like the boneyard, right? Like your defunct equipment, but guess what? There's probably still some flammables in your defunct equipment. So like understanding how that plays into the safety of your overall operation. Um, and so actually, so this says, uh, yeah, 18 meters or 60 feet. This data actually comes straight out of um, wind-driven fire modeling that says that you know, if you're not in a standard wildfire and you've got like some straight up fire tornado type situation where it's wind driven, the flame lengths get super long because they're flattened out. Um, and so if your structures like most California farms, you know, your structures are usually clustered, right? They're pretty close together so that like your tractor barn is close to like your other equipment and maybe even your, you know, cold storage, et cetera, right? So that's very challenging uh, to meet this criteria. But if you know that you've got clustering and that that is a weak point, you can do something about it by, you know, continuing to like make that your priority part of your operation for maintaining, you know, vegetation, et cetera. Um, so anyway, just sort of flagging that these ones are relatively easy. This actually does come into play, um, Annika, like for the combustible chemicals, right? There is regulatory compliance already around this um, action item here. And so that's to your point, they usually have to be in secondary containment anyway, um, but it's something, you know, to just remind, you know, that this is low hanging fruit, like just put everything in secondary containment and put it away from, you know, other important stuff, right? So that if it does ignite, at least it's kind of, kind of staying in one spot and maybe not traveling to your water source or, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. 
Okay. Um, I kind of just wanted to show a few from each of these categories that are kind of the top, but I'll just also emphasize this and then we'll kind of just break out into some, uh, you know, uh, Q and A. Um, yeah, emergency access. I hear time and time again from our CAL FIRE um, folks that are on the advisory council that emergency access is one of the biggest issues. Um, it's either you know, overgrown, it can't support the weight of a fire engine, there are poor signage, like firefighters love it when people are like, oh yeah, I know right where my, you know, water hookups are, great, but if it's not a reflective sign, because a lot of these fires are happening at night, then they won't see it, they won't be able to access it, and so they won't use it, and you want, you know, you want Cal Fire or other operators to use your site because if you have a good site for them to fight a fire from, that means they're also probably going to you know save your structures. So um, there's some win-win there if you're doing emergency access in general. Yes, go ahead, Darcy. Um, that's uh, actually don't remember hearing much about reflective signs. Is that something that Cal Fire you know offers you know cheaper or more readily available to producers? Oh my gosh, we should have written that into the grant. What a great idea. Um, you know what? I don't know. I will ask. Um, uh, Zach Main is our ad advisory council member that I was referring to, and um, he's up in the Cape Valley um, working at Good Hummus, uh, Hummus Farm. And um, that's a great question. I bet they would know. Um, this is something right below that that's actually relevant to your question. Is this lockbox type thing? Because actually that's something that Cal Fire does offer free, right? Where you can have um, them be able to access a key to your facility. Um, and that could be gate keys or house keys or whatever. But even if you have a lockbox on file, um, they might not use it in an emergency, right? They might just break your gate down um, because you really have to uh, n understand that like sometimes you've got crews from Australia, right? It's not your local yeah. office that's responding. Yeah. Um, and so they don't know your area and they don't have that info. And this is kind of where that ag pass is really useful is that if you can get back in and, and communicate some of those specifics to whoever's your managing unit and understanding kind of that incident command system, right, that they use, that's where it can be more useful. Those things like the hidden mailbox or lockbox, you know, for emergency personnel. So it's a good it's a good point though that um, they probably do have maybe some signage like grants. So I will ask that. That's a great question. That's actually something that the farm bureau might be farm bureaus might be interested in. Um, you know, providing at a, a reduced rate. You know, they could buy in bulk. I love that. Yeah, I I, I didn't catch which grant you got. What whose funds are you you, you got to develop this? Oh, sorry. Are you asking? Darcy? Yeah, I was just curious because I was thinking Fire Safe Council might be another another potential partner too to help. Oh, yeah, that's a that. good Cause idea. Because they have a big hardening project, and I would consider those uh, a piece of the hardening picture. You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't actually stop. The, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop the fire per se, but. But my brother was has been a career firefighter and uh, for an urban municipal. Uh, company and they went on mutual aids every summer and they call them pavement queens so wherever the city fire trucks can go that's where they stake out and they just protect the neighborhood but he went to a lot of places up in what sonoma county um the big fire up there uh towards Glen ellen and every uh anyways i can't even keep them all straight but they were on a they were basically on a vineyard and they were staked out next to the next to the um you know the barrel house or whatever <laughs> the, yeah. the, so um yeah if you make it like you said if you make it more hospitable for those responders it, it's always in your benefit yep and that's a good point actually a lot of vineyards act like pretty good buffers because they tend to have wider rows big you know surrounding um farm access around their their um vineyards and then also the leaves are have relatively high moisture content and so they they don't burn much sometimes they lose like a row or two but that's something to note if you're serving any clients if they border vineyards that's really to their benefit to have those relationships and understand that um because like you said um emergency personnel are more likely to access something that's easy you know to get into and also less likely to burn so they'll you know be fighting fire from that kind of um angle or perspective so 
Yep. Okay, I'm going to um, just stop my share so we have time to um, jump back in to uh, the end of our presentation, but also, um, whoop, all right, um, I'm, I, can, I have so many tabs open, my lord, let's try this. Um, but feel free to ask any questions as we go. Um, okay. Was that fun? Y'all like a live demo? We haven't really done that in that format before. So that was fun for me. Um, and that's what matters. No, I'm kidding. Um, so yes, cool. Wanted to just, you know, plug again, check out Farmer Campus. They've got that online course so folks can just do it as they're able. And in fact, that's how I discovered the job I have now and farmer campus is that I was working in, uh, you know, at a nonprofit farm, uh, educational farm and looking for resources because I was helping them recover from the 2020 uh, CZU lightning complex impacts. And um, I was like, wait, free online wildfire like training for farmers. So I was like already doing some of their content by the time I applied to the position I have now. So I just want to, uh, you know, flag just how uh, valuable that was and that a lot of the people I met in those classes are now people that we partner with and like, you know, have relationships with. And so it's a really great place also to build the network. Um, but also, if you want the updated version of this workbook, once we, you know, I think as you saw in Natalia's little video, um, spot there that there is a, a more finalized version coming out um, towards the end of this year. And so if you, you know, want that, um, make sure to stay connected. Um, and it sounds like, you know, yeah, opportunities too to, to help us with this content and, and any feedback that you see. Um, and in fact, we'll, we'll be sending an eval to y'all as well. So you can tell us what you like, what we're missing and all of that. Um, so there's my info, there's our program website. If you uh, don't wanna type that stuff in, maybe Dom can throw it in the chat, but also um, if you're familiar with the CAF website, it's pretty standard. It's just, you know, www.caf.org. And then you can find us through the programs drop down. Um, and we have all sorts of fun stuff like podcasts and short videos, if you like to get your content that way. So, um, and I think, I think that's our last slide and we'll just um, cruise into um, sort of a, a opportunity for y'all to tell us what you're thinking feeling at this point um, I wanted to um, yeah sorry I'm just cruise into my agenda so I can we're gonna debrief as a, as a group so um, in the meantime uh, Dom if you can uh, set the eval link it's just a Google form for y'all and it takes like a few minutes while we're having this chat if you don't mind. Um, but I wanted to say we also run a statewide wildfire and ag stakeholder group so that's just a Google group at this point but it's pretty easy if you're interested. I'll just send you an email about what it is. If you like it, you sign up on a little Google form and then you get added to the group. But basically that's our place for like this kind of nuanced, you know, wildfire ag crossover training opportunities, resources. So anytime we produce a resource, we push it out through that group and vice versa when there's stuff that's coming through from other orgs and stuff that seems relevant, you know, folks in that group um, can do that. And so that's really nice. Um, and then also, um, yeah, just, uh, opening it up for any, you know, ideas for improvement or gaps. I mean, I know you haven't had a chance to sit with the workbook super long time, but if you see something in there, please don't be shy, reach out, tell us if it's like just, you know, yeah, not, not jive in or if it could just be improved or whatever it is. So we know it's a, uh, a moving target and a very interesting field because more and more, you know, research in, in these areas is being conducted. And also we're trying to leverage indigenous knowledge, right? And other ways of knowing how to do things on the landscape to help protect and, and recover from wildfire. So I'll leave it at that. I've been talking a long time. I wanna hear from y'all. Uh, well, your, your final comment where you just said you wanna incorporate um, indigenous knowledge. Uh, I think that's um, obviously really applicable, applicable right now. And uh, it would be interesting to see um, you know, what you add to that. So, I mean, it would, it would be different for each region of the state, you know, it's Northern California is so different from Southern California, but um, yeah, I think that'd be really great. Yeah, I'm excited, um, especially 
about uh, the idea. So I don't know if you've heard of a, a cultural easement, but this is something that the Amat Mutsun has um, been doing with Pi Ranch on uh, you know unceded territory of the Awaswas people in the central coast up there. But basically they have as part of the deed that rides with the property um, that the tribe gets to access it for cultural resources, natural resources, ceremony. Um, and so I think what we're also trying to hope is to build more trusting relationships, but also get, you know, land managers, owners, et cetera, like understanding the wider benefits of managing their lands with this like lens towards, you know, cultural beneficial fires and other, other uh, applicable practices that, you know, can benefit a, a much wider range of, of target goals. So, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I've never heard about that. That's interesting. Yeah, cultural easements is my new is my new jam. <laughs> cool. Any other feedback? Yeah, I just want to take a moment to thank you, Amber, and um, tell you that this is a, a really cool thing. I think you brought up a lot of points that um, people don't think about quite often. And uh, it's it's condensed in a really nice way. Um, I guess my one of my big questions is like, do you plan on printing out workbook forms and keeping that? Like, how do you plan on kind of doing like the the media for this? And how do you plan on like having more people see it in in their hands specifically? Yeah. Thanks. Good feedback and great question. Um. So. If we get the CAL FIRE grant that we want, um, there are some big plans to transfer the maintenance of the workbook um, to CAF from Farmer Campus. So just giving kudos to them because they really did the bulk of the work and we're really the partner to kind of um, continue to find, you know, uh, ways to apply it, get it out there, et cetera. So like you're saying, um, I think that that 2023 edition will be like kind of our final version for at least a few years. And we hope to print that, also have it translated to Spanish because that hasn't been done yet. Although it was created with, um, Natalia is both bicultural and bilingual. So, you know, has that lens already of considering like the language and things like that in terms of how we're presenting it um, so that it can be accessible to a wide range of operators. But um, so the answer is sort of TBD, but the plan is hopefully to have CAF that be housed at CAF as sort of one of our resources that we steward and they'll still be, you know, co-authors um, on it as things move on. But basically, you know, it, it fits a bit more um, in our wheelhouse because Farmer Campus is, is moving towards a larger climate related lens instead of just wildfire. And so that's kind of why it makes sense for us to like, you know, hold on to it um, in the meantime. And so that's the plan, but we don't know exactly how that's going to work funding wise yet. So we'll we'll see. But uh, I think that we have had a really successful um, relationship with them. And so we want to continue that and build on that. Um, and yeah, do, do them proud, basically, because uh, this is such a, a beautiful resource. Um, and we had a few printed for the <laughs> EcoFarm. Uh, conference this year that you know we handed out um, and that sort of thing and so that was sort of like our pilot dry run just to see and it was interesting a lot of people liked the digital format there was only you know but I, I'm a I'm old school I like the paper version and so you know um, we just want to have it available in all of those those uh, formats for folks so yeah that that sounds good I think uh, in our region um again, going back to the Fire Safe Council would be a good resource. Um, they do presentations on things similar to this pretty frequently. I don't know if you've ever, uh, or if you're familiar with uh, the children's book, The Fiscalini, The Firefox. Um, no, that sounds it's, awesome. It's, it's great. Yeah, it's a, it's a children's animated, uh, uh, like flip through book and it, and it talks about evacuation routes and home hardening. And it's distributed in the elementary schools in Cambria, and also wow. at the uh, the statewide fair. There's uh, like a fire safe council, like home hardening kind of booth, and they have nice. a bunch of copies there. Um, but it seems like this would be kind of a cool, you know, not companion document, but something in the same vein, but just a different avenue with with ag being uh, the focus rather than the youth. But um, yeah, yeah, it seems yeah, no, like. 
We're always looking for those partnerships and plug in points. So if you're at all able to just email me like a little snippet, exactly that, like, and maybe the contact name or something that would be like perfect. And then I can follow up and, and reach out and see what the options are. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So hopefully everybody got a chance to do the eval. If not, we'll bug you through email. <laughs> it is almost 3.30. Anyone else want to add? I won't force you to log off at 3.30, but want to respect your time. Well, it was a great um, just overview about this tool and this resource and to know you guys are working on it. I will have to let it trickle down through my, you know, <laughs> my little sifter, uh, how we can pull any of this and, and implement it. Uh, our apprenticeship program is small, and so we don't really engage a lot of farms, but I am concerned that we are putting out the most uh, state-of-the-art resources to help our apprentices effectively help their employers because that's sometimes it's a managing up concern. <laughs> totally. Yeah. There's sometimes a luxury in a, when you're like line staff, right. To see things from a different perspective and maybe, you know, right. make some recommendations or share. Well, some and, it, and it, 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 it's a way also our apprenticeship adds value for those employers, you know, because the employers may, may, may bring back things that the, that the grower just hasn't had their head around. Um, yeah. Totally. I love yeah. that. Well, you y'all are in, um, sorry, you're in um, Woodland, right? Is that correct? That's the Center for Land-Based Learning is in Woodland. I happen to be in Hood River, Oregon, <laughs> but, oh, um, but yeah, I get to work remotely, which is pretty okay. sweet. But um, well, um, our Grizzly Corps, Dom is headquartered in Davis at Glide Ranch. And so okay. we'll have, yeah. sadly, sadly, we're losing Dom in like a Aww. week and a half because their service term is ending. But um, and it'll be big shoes to fill. But we'll have another incoming Grizzly Corps fellow starting in like mid September. And so if there is uh, any activities in the Woodland area that we could send them to after they're onboarded, we can you know start integrating like what we're doing with what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. Well, it, it may be something as simple as we do have monthly cohort calls with our apprentices just to, um, you know, we cover a lot of different topics, but often it's, um, you know, as needed training, like we just hit heat illness with them last month, you know, before the heat started. Um, so maybe there's a way to insert just an overview of this resource and just like you did, you know, orient them to the tool. Um, so we can think about maybe that as a, as a possibility. Absolutely. For, like, have meetings with apprentices. Yeah. Well, this will be recorded and we'll add it to our media page on our, you know, main landing page as well as the Catholics. And so, you know, if they just also want to like look at this sort of on their own time and then ask questions or however they want to do that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. So good. Thanks for coming. You bet. Contributing. Amazing. Thank you all. Any last, um, any last thoughts, Spencer? Nope. Thank you. Another, <laughs> another working lunch in the future. Another working lunch. Yes. We, we Great. should be on that. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate you. Bye, bye bye. Thank you. Ciao.